Even if you grew up watching documentaries or studying World War II in school, it's likely that you never heard of or saw many black soldiers in the movies that characterize the war. Your teacher likely omitted the fact that black soldiers fought in the war, some of them as free men and others as slaves. Why, therefore, were the contributions made by black African soldiers ignored? The simple answer is racial segregation. White soldiers and officers said that black soldiers were weak and useless in combat. Yet during the war, they fought for democracy even as a segregated army and marched as conquerors. They returned home as victors, determined to change their country. Welcome to yet another exciting video about black history. Here we highlight the historical existence of black people and their contribution to Western civilization. In today's video, we'll provide you with in-depth knowledge about the forgotten experiences of African-American soldiers during World War II. This is the story of the hundreds of thousands of African-American veterans and community members who came home hoping for a more accepting country, only to find, with much disappointment, that not much had changed at home. Racism was still prevalent, and segregation remained the legal norm. Stay with me through to the very end as I take you through this historic true life event. After the war, African-American soldiers stationed in Germany encountered a situation that was entirely strange to them. For the first time in their life, they experienced being treated with respect, they could interact with white ladies, and were served in restaurants. It was an event that would define these African-American soldiers. General Powell stated that black soldiers were in many ways better off when we were stationed in Germany, despite the gains being made in the U.S. at the time. In 1959, as a young lieutenant in the Army, Powell was stationed in Germany when he experienced what he called in his autobiography, a breath of freedom. Medgar Evers was a prominent civil rights leader in Mississippi after serving in the military during World War II. He used the abilities he acquired during the conflict to effectively organize for change. His increasing fame also made him a target. On June 12, 1963, Evers was fatally shot outside his Jackson residence, remarkably, by another white World War II veteran. Congressman John Lewis, a teenage civil rights activist, also frequently put his life in danger, sometimes working with veterans. These black veterans identified with the civil rights movement and became a part of it. He once said that, they believed that by traveling overseas, they had fought for equality and democracy. We now have to return home to resume our fight. For what do we fight? Was our mission as black soldiers to just combat the Nazis in the European theater of operations? Walter White, the executive secretary of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People from 1929 to 1955, stated that many of the African-American soldiers he spoke with in early 1944 in Britain asked him this same question. More than 2.5 million black men signed up for the draft when World War II started, volunteering their services to a nation that did not regard them equally as citizens. Black military personnel were housed in distinct barracks, fed in different meal halls, and got medical care in different hospitals. They were frequently never even in combat because white officers thought they were inferior and incompetent. Some even rose to fame as a result of their services. Two examples are the Tuskegee Airmen, who flew more than 15,000 missions, and Doris Dory Miller, who was awarded the Navy Cross for gallantry during the Pearl Harbor attack. However, this does not imply that black Americans did not make contributions on the home front as well. Many relocated to cities in the North to contribute to the defense sector, and they certainly played a big part in the winning of the war. However, all of their labor went unacknowledged. Let's start with the question of how black GIs contributed to the victory in World War II. Based on the research of historians and filmmakers, this seems like an easy one to answer. In Italy, the all-black 92nd Infantry Division engaged in combat with the Germans, and in the Pacific, the all-black 93rd Infantry Division engaged the Japanese. Trained at Montford Point, black Marines fought on Peleliu, Iwo Jima, and Guam. Authors have even focused on select all-black combat units, such as the 761st Tank Battalion, which fought with General Patton during the Battle of the Bulge. The Tuskegee Airmen also became so famous after the war that numerous books, movies, and documentaries have been written about them. However, 
the combined number of black combat units was just 20% of all black men in uniform during World War II. This data raises an interesting question in everyone's mind. How did the remaining 80%, or almost 880,000 young black men, contribute to the victory of the war? Examining behind the front lines will reveal the solution. During World War II, 80% of black GIs served in the service forces. The vast majority of black soldiers in U.S. military history were assigned to the service forces, where they frequently worked in segregated pick-and-shovel brigades. Nevertheless, the modernization of the U.S. armed forces, which put troops and supplies on wheels to keep up with tanks and airplanes, produced an unexpected demand for larger and more trained service forces. This was the experience of the majority of black GIs during the first three years of World War II, by using black GIs to fill the manpower gap, the U.S. Army was able to continue the war effort, making black GIs an essential component of the force. Nestled in the heart of a national forest, 30 miles east of the larger resort town of Ludington, lay the small settlement of Idlewild. Idlewild is an incorporated village in southeast Lake County, a rural area in northwest lower Michigan, in Yates Township. It is situated immediately east of Baldwin, it was one of the few resorts in the nation where African Americans could go on vacation and buy real estate in the first half of the 20th century before discrimination was prohibited in 1964 by the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The Manistee National Forest encompasses the surrounding area. Lake Idlewild is included in the community and the Pear Marquette River headwaters are spread out over the area. The resort was far enough away by car from major cities like Chicago, St. Louis, or Detroit but it was also sufficiently hidden that African Americans could avoid the ugly discrimination of Jim Crow laws. From 1912 until the middle of the 1960s, Idlewild, dubbed the Black Eden of Michigan, was a thriving year-round town that attracted well-known professionals and performers from all over the nation. Up to 25,000 people would visit Idlewild during the height of the summer to enjoy camping, swimming, boating, fishing, hunting, horseback riding, roller skating, and nighttime entertainment. At its height, it was one of the most well-liked resorts in the Midwest. It was a resort unlike anything else in the country. Black people could visit there without worrying that they wouldn't be served or that they wouldn't be able to use the hotel, motel, or facilities. A group of white developers recognized an opportunity to profit from the expanding black middle class and their discretionary income, so they established Idlewild. Establishment and Development of Idlewild A small but distinct African-American middle class had emerged at this time in several American cities, including several in the Midwest. This class was primarily made up of professionals and small company owners. Even though they were financially able to go for leisure, racial segregation kept them from engaging in recreational activities in the majority of the region's resort areas. The Idlewild Resort Company, IRC, was founded by four white land developers and their spouses after they saw an opportunity. Wilbur M. Branch, Erastus and Flora Branch, Adelbert and Isabel Branch, of nearby White Cloud, Michigan, and A.E. and Mamie Lemon, and Chicago's Mandolin Wright established IRC before World War I. Erastus Branch established a cottage, homesteaded the land for three years, and ultimately acquired the land title through his branch, Anderson Imperial Real Estate Company, which turned into the hub of the resort town to secure land rights. The community's name is said to allude to idle men and wild women in a folk tale. Present-day inhabitants support this retelling of the tale by offering light-hearted t-shirts bearing this saying during the yearly summer festivals in Idlewilders. As soon as the IRC acquired this site, it hired black professionals like Charles Anderson, who effectively promoted the resort by word of mouth and hired African-American middle-class salespeople to market the lot. Critical to the development of black institutions such as Idlewild was also the black press. Black publications such as the Pittsburgh Courier, the Indianapolis Recorder, and the Chicago Defender ran advertisements for the IRC. These advertisements in these well-known news publications offer lots for just $1 a month and $6 down. Citing options for hunting, fishing, boating, and horseback riding, the advertisement was quite successful because it capitalized on the black community's tendency to spend small sums of money over an extended period. African Americans would, for instance, 
joined burial organizations where they were required to contribute a few pence each week toward their eventual funeral costs. By giving them tours of the rural community, IRC arranged trips to draw middle-class Africans from Detroit, Chicago, and other Midwestern cities. Their advertisements in national news outlets touted the attractions for boating, fishing, hunting, and horseback riding, and they offered lots at $1 down and $1 a month. The village of beautiful Idlewild is referred to as the Hunter's Paradise and is highlighted in a 1919 leaflet used by IRC to promote the area. It is known for its beautiful lakes of pure spring water and its myriads of game fish. In addition, supporters of the neighborhood highlighted how black people could walk freely without ostracism and hatred in a place where they would feel like American citizens and that there were the speed at which the black quartermasters were dispatched is indicative of their significance. Delivering supplies was dangerous. When Jones's group had established camp four miles inland, he stated, immediately the truckers took their vehicle to the nearby ammunition and gasoline depots, loaded up and headed to the front. According to Jones, as soon as they were within range of the enemy's artillery, they came under fire. When the German 7th and 5th Panzer armies started to retreat on August 25, 1944, the army set up the Red Ball Express to move supplies quickly to the 1st and 3rd American armies, which were approaching quickly. Upon joining the Red Ball Express, Jones was surrounded by supportive individuals as three of the four Red Ball drivers were black GIs. Jones did not drive to the front. Instead, his company picked up supplies at the beach and handed them over to another vehicle halfway through. However, they were compelled to drive at night with blackout lights because of the threat of German bombardment. The way the drivers drive reveals their faithfulness. Those slits, or cat's eyes as we called them, did an amazing job driving at night loaded with high-octane gas and all sorts of ammunition and explosives, Jones stated. In 82 days, Jones and 23,000 other quartermasters in the Red Ball Express moved 412, 193 tons of supplies and kept Patton's Third Army moving as it rushed toward Germany. Our speed was 30 to 40 miles per hour regardless of the weather, and we traveled every night. For several reasons, drivers on the Red Ball Express did not escape combat. During the Battle of the Bulge, Jones and his men were stranded behind enemy lines while delivering gasoline. They saved some Allied infantrymen who had been forced to retreat by the Germans near St. Vith. He claimed that initially, nothing seemed promising, one thing needs to be kept in mind. Jones and his group eventually returned to Burgulaires, where combat officers greeted them and requested volunteers to serve in the infantry. Everything we were hearing was bad before they found the hole we escaped through, the survivors reported. In December 1944, the Battle of the Bulge caused the American troops to lose men more quickly than they could be replaced, leading to a manpower crisis. Black GIs from the service forces volunteered to fill the void thanks to the persuasiveness of Lieutenant General John C. H. Lee, the Confederate General's descendant and commander of the communication zone of the European theater. 4,500 had volunteered in less than two months, and 2,800 of them were organized into black rifle platoons that were part of the 1945 invasion of Germany. It appears that the blacks performed admirably at the bulge because nobody considered returning them to the kitchen because they were still needed, Jones remarked. Jones was able to apply his tank mechanic skills after being deployed to the 961st Tank Ordnance following the Remagen Bridge crossover. Like Young, Jones assumed increasingly competent missions as the war dragged on, carrying out tasks that were previously limited to white GIs. Jeffries Bassett, Jones, Charles Pittman, and the Leto Road. In the China-Burma-India Theater of Operations, Sergeant Jeff Jones of the 518th Quartermaster Truck Battalion began his combat tour on the opposite side of the world. He offered to drive trucks on the Leto Road not long after arriving in Assam, a state in northeastern India situated south of the Himalayan mountains. Most of the drivers in the convoys were black GIs like Jones, and they set out at night to escape Japanese snipers. Their first task was to transport fuel and ammunition to the American airbase in Kunming, where Major General Claire Chennault and the 10th Air Force flew in support of the airlift dubbed the Hump, that supplied Chinese forces commanded by Chiang Kai-shek over the Himalayan mountains between India and China. 
The Chinese might not have been able to combat the Japanese without this aerial supply operation, which would have freed up over a million Japanese soldiers to engage the Allies in the Pacific. Jones discussed how tough it is to maneuver trucks up mountain slopes. I felt I could operate a truck very well, so I was prepared when the initial appeal for volunteers came out. After one run through the Himalayas on the Lado Road convinced me that I was a mere amateur who was quite willing to learn the tricks of the trade, he claimed, adding, I was a real nuisance to the convoy my first night out, and principles used on flat terrain just did not work in the mountains. Eventually though, he claimed to be driving the hump as natural as breathing. Even as an experienced driver, he still found his job to be difficult. Driving in the mud during monsoon season was worse than driving on ice, according to Jones, who also noted that the pace was exhausting and that we drove 12 months a year, monsoon season and all. Additional hazards were caused by overweight vehicles. We would have been court-martialed in the States for the loads we were carrying as we drove the Leto Road at night, he declared. Jones stated that the commitment and expertise of the black combat engineers who maintained the Leto Road open was one aspect that gave him a sense of security. He remarked, the road washed away in places or there would be a landslide during the monsoon season. In the pouring rain, these engineers would start to work on bulldozers to restore the road's usability as soon as possible. He added, the black engineers were there when he arrived and were still at work when he and the rest of the 518th left. They had to work on the road during the day, so they kept rifles in hand because of the snipers. They built and fought at the same time, and they got the job done. As far as I know, none of them received furloughs, he stated. Similar to Jones, Corporal Charles Pittman said that when he offered to drive the Leto Road, he had no idea what he was getting himself into. Charles stated, I was transporting airplane bombs on my truck and I found it to be thrilling. As he started his first run in the dark, he added, We were using blackout lights, so I was concentrating on the truck in front of me, so I couldn't see much. I saw that we were climbing because I kept changing gears to keep up with the man in front of me. We were traveling six miles at a straight upward grade. By the time we made it back, he was getting used to driving and started to pay attention to his surroundings. He started back down the slopes as the sun was rising. Although Pittman was a skilled driver who was awarded five battle stars for driving at night in places where snipers had entered, he admitted that there were still times when he felt extreme terror. China was allowed access to the Leto Road later in his tour of duty. He had clear memories of his first journey to China, especially crossing the Salween River on a bridge. He added, When I found out the bridge was made of rope, my hair stood up on my neck. It could only have one truck on it at a time. Pittman was pleased with their abilities saying, need I say we were damn good truck drivers. They were swinging back and forth between the mountains over a river that looked like a night crawler because it was so deep down. You had a lot of doubts that this contraption was going to hold, but it did. We weren't called F and F-E for nothing. It meant fighting and freighting. We delivered the goods wherever we were directed. What do these stories tell us about how black geese helped win the war? Pittman's boast encapsulates the core of the effort Black G's and service units made to the victory. They were willing to go above and beyond to keep soldiers on the front lines, even if it meant suffering injuries, traversing the Himalayan rope bridge, or driving across a swinging bridge. Lawrence Young and the other Black G's and port companies prepared allied forces for the D-Day invasion. Their accounts, along with those of the other four Black quartermasters, demonstrata how crucial they were to the outcome of important campaigns throughout World War II. Patton's quick advance was made possible by black GIs like Chester Jones and those in the Red Ball Express. China was able to stay in the war thanks to black drivers on the Leto Road like Jeff Jones and Charles Pittman. The growth and evolution of U.S. service forces during World War II allowed these young black men to have an impact on the war's outcome. In the final two years of the war, Black GIs took on a wide range of new responsibilities and accepted the challenge of supporting U.S. armed forces across the globe. To serve the Army, the Black Quartermasters in the European theater acquired a variety of talents. After working on cranes until D-Day, Lawrence Young turned his attention to building bridges. Chester Jones began his career as a nighttime high-speed truck driver before transitioning to tank repair. Jeff Jones and Charles Pittman learned how to drive overweight vehicles up the sides of the world's largest mountains in the China-Burma-India theater. 
they also knew they had made a difference, as seen by the pride they showed in their wartime duty during their interviews. One can wonder if these black quartermasters thought their contributions were appreciated. The quick response is no. The battle was the beginning of the sensation of being ignored. When Lado Road was finally constructed and officially opened, Jeff Jones felt betrayed. The majority of the goods were brought by black truckers, who were not included in the event. There was one black driver in a convoy of 50 trucks that went over this new intersection, the speaker stated. On the road, the ratio was typically exactly the opposite. The black quartermasters believed that their military duty would improve their civilian life back in America once the war came to a close. They felt let down. Charles Pittman stated, Everyone was anxious to get home and felt things would not be the same after the particular hell we had been through. Lawrence Young stated he had expected to be welcomed when his ship docked in New York City, as we had heard that they welcome soldiers when they get back, but there was nobody to welcome us. It turned out we were wrong. When an interviewer asked Young what he thought he was fighting for in World War II, he said, I'm asking that today. What did I fight for? Because we had no rights, as you know. I believe that the emotions I experienced during the 1963 March on Washington were the worst of my life. As a veteran serving my nation, here I am pleading for the right to vote and have a better life as an American. Years later, a salesman came by Young's home and tried to sell him a history of World War II. He said, I looked through the book and there was nothing in there about what African Americans did in World War II. That was probably done to prevent us from receiving credit for anything we accomplished, yet we were essential to their victory. Furthermore, a large number of African Americans served in the U.S. During the Second World War, white Americans were frequently viewed by the armed forces as posing a bigger threat to their freedom than German or Japanese forces. The most striking example of this came during the U.S. Army's involvement in the battle in Britain. When African American soldiers arrived in Britain, they were taken aback to discover that their welcome was drastically different from what they had anticipated. These men and women most certainly expected Britain to be much the same, as many had grown up in the shadow of Jim Crow legislation in the United States. Instead, the British people greeted them with great warmth for the most part. Despite this, a few white American soldiers felt it appropriate to attempt enforcing in Britain the same segregation laws as in the US. Consequently, the island nation swiftly turned into a flashpoint for racial unrest and witnessed multiple violent clashes between white and black Americans, the latter of whom frequently received unexpected assistance from British citizens. The question was whether and how the United States was going to enforce racial segregation. Leadership from both the United States and the United Kingdom vigorously debated the Army's presence in Britain during World War II. Additionally, it catalyzed a great deal of conflict between African-American and white American soldiers, the latter of whom frequently received assistance from British citizens. The American military services were heavily influenced by Jim Crow by the time of World War II. In practically every facet of military life, racial segregation was implemented on an official and informal basis to a degree akin to that observed in civilian society. This started with the implementation of the separate but equal principle during enlisting. The choice was made to permit the enlistment of black soldiers in the United States. Armed forces, however, they would serve in all black segregated units, frequently commanded by white officers. Due to restrictions like arbitrary and discriminatory literacy tests that were designed to explicitly target African Americans for service, many of them were turned away. Some were turned down just because the recruiting office for their region covertly implemented policies that forbade the hiring of African Americans. Other facets of life for black soldiers in the U.S. military were far from equal. They were frequently given subpar instruction. At Camp Gordon Johnston in Florida, one soldier complained that, the first two weeks we laid around doing nothing. The third week they started us cleaning the white officers' rooms, dressing their dirty beds, and cleaning the latrine. Additionally, black soldiers discovered that they were not eligible for several army occupations. Most African-American units were restricted to the service forces and labor forces. For instance, before the war, Private Lawrence W. Harris, a toolmaker, wrote to the Pittsburgh Courier, I was in hopes I could become an airplane mechanic, but the field doesn't seem to be open to Negro soldiers. 
In the United States, racial segregation was commonplace in both military and civilian institutions. Black troops found that the services they received were frequently inferior or non-existent. Black soldiers at Camp Gordon Johnston were told, we don't serve colored, and were thus refused entry to the camp's religious services, as well as service organizations. One soldier put it best when he talked about how difficult it was to get to recreation areas by bus. Whenever we get a bus, they will only take five colored soldiers, and sometimes we have to wait about two or three hours for a bus. For many African-American soldiers, it was particularly offensive to see Italian and German prisoners of war enjoying greater privileges than they did. Discrimination, hate speech, and racial violence were common on U.S. Army bases in the United States, where both black and white servicemen were present. Not long after the first African Americans started training, in April 1941, a lynching took place in Fort Benning, Georgia, marking the beginning of a significant act of racial violence. Following an altercation over the use of a diving platform at the YMCA Lake area, black soldiers and the military police at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, crashed shortly after. Another notorious incident happened in Fayetteville, Georgia, where several intoxicated black soldiers were prevented from boarding a bus by unarmed black military policemen, MPs, whose duty was to maintain order on the buses that went to and from Fort Bragg. A delegation of armed white military police arrived and attempted to apprehend the main troublemakers after the soldiers started threatening the MPs. They then started using their nightsticks to attack a few of the black soldiers. Amidst the chaos, a soldier took a handgun from a member of the MP and opened fire on him. Several MPs retaliated by firing back. The shooting resulted in the deaths of one black soldier and one white military policeman, as well as the injuries of two MPs and three further black troops. Many African-American soldiers in and near Fort Bragg were consequently picked up and imprisoned in the fort stockade. Even though many of them were not engaged, Many of the soldiers wrote home complaining about the unusually harsh searches that were done on them. More encounters between white civilian police officers and military police across the country led to armed conflicts. Examples of these incidents include the shooting at Camp Stewart and George, where over 5,000 shots were fired between black soldiers and white military policemen, and the incidents in Murfreesboro, Tennessee and Gurdon, Arkansas, where African-American troops engaged in training exercises ran into armed resistance from citizens and state police. Additionally, both from within the military and from the white civilian community, African Americans serving in the military encountered harsh and frequently violent opposition from their fellow citizens in the United States. They were unable to get away from Jim Crow oppression, not even while serving their nation. But because segregation was suddenly no longer the standard, this made the African-American soldier's experience in Britain all the more remarkable. The effects of this drastic change would become evident very quickly. The British population welcomed African-American soldiers more warmly than they had anticipated upon their arrival. Black servicemen were frequently welcomed into the homes of British residents, and many African-Americans voiced amazement at the British government's kind treatment of them. Many African Americans in Britain were reportedly impressed by the courteous demeanor of African American soldiers and frequently praised their manners. Walter White said that many African Americans in Britain told him it was their first experience in being treated as normal human beings, as friends by white people. During the American Army's stay in Britain, some of the most divisive race clashes resulted from interracial relationships. Many white American soldiers were deeply irritated by British women's willingness to date black American men since it addressed one of the most contentious facets of Jim Crow prejudice. Perceived competition over women was the trigger for much of the violence in and around Southern military bases in the United States, according to reports. Nonetheless, in contrast to numerous other facets of American racial sentiments introduced to Britain, the British populace frequently expressed disapproval towards racial mixing between British women and African-American men. The involvement of British women in these partnerships and the response of British citizens can provide valuable insights into the state of affairs in Britain at this period. Relationships between black men and white women were viewed by many Americans as blatant violations of societal norms. Full racial integration raised many concerns, even among socially progressive whites. I want my colored friend to vote, 
I want him to know and enjoy the four freedoms, an American lieutenant once said. It was a topic that remained unimaginable to many white Americans and one that posed a serious issue once in Britain. I will work hard to see that he or his sons get these things, but I do not want him to live next door. I do not want him to dance with my daughter, the lieutenant continued. It seemed to many white Americans that many British women had no special idea that contact with black males should be of any concern, in contrast to American tendencies regarding race and sex. According to Robin Cruikshank, chief of the American department, the many African-American soldiers did find that they were welcomed by people who noted their courteous behavior and friendly smiles, not just the color of their skin. Certain British politicians, particularly conservatives, contended that since societal standards in the United States forbade unions between black men and white women, the same should apply to Britain. Some of the regional commissioners have expressed considerable apprehension as to the difficulties that the presence of American colored troops and their association with the civilian population, particularly British women, is likely to create in their regions, according to a report from the British War Cabinet. The British authorities therefore recognized the conflicts that would arise from interracial sexual relationships early on and took a position that such relationships would be problematic in terms of relations with white American soldiers. Several regional commissioners have informed me that, in their experience, some British women appear to find a peculiar fascination in associating with men of color and that this association is resented by American white soldiers and is likely to give rise to difficult social problems in their regions. It is noteworthy that the rationale for labeling these partnerships as problematic was based on their association with racial and social tensions in Britain that emerged from the American presence, rather than the fact that the interracial relationships per se existed. However, the report's wording suggests, using the phrase, a peculiar fascination, that these interactions were still viewed as odd and inappropriate this sheds light on racism in Britain during the 1940s and makes a significant point about how Americans responded to British social standing. It demonstrates that racism in Britain persisted, but in a more muted form than in the US, particularly about interracial couples. Contrary to many contemporary popular notions regarding Britain's reception of African-American soldiers during World War II, there is strong evidence of hostility to African-Americans' presence and contact with white Britons particularly women. British views on race were not homogenous. In one instance in Derby, black soldiers were frequently observed entering with two British women, leading the authorities to accuse them of keeping a disorderly house, effectively calling them prostitutes. A man named Mr. Pinder argued on behalf of the women, saying that the police sergeant's evidence did not point to the house being a disorderly one, and that these were the only two colored soldiers who entered the premises and added that there was no law in this country to prevent white women from taking Negroes to their homes. This is a prime example of the widespread belief held by certain British residents and white American soldiers alike that British ladies who engaged with African Americans were probably prostitutes. But as the same example demonstrates, this was untrue. British authorities probably used this argument to portray women who were connected to African-American males as prostitutes to appease American opinions of and responses to these encounters. The British government sought to damage the reputation of women who were known to welcome African-Americans into their houses to deter white Americans from seeking retaliation. The government was particularly concerned about an increase in racial violence brought on by the presence of both black and white Americans. However, it's also possible that attempts to break up these unions were only motivated by racist views held by certain British officials. Though there was considerable discussion within the Bolero Combined Committee regarding the dissemination of false information regarding black GI's sexual illnesses, the British government did not take significant steps to stop interracial partnerships from developing. In the end, it was determined that the British government should not move to impose any kind of isolation. The British War Department realized that it would be challenging to enforce any kind of segregation in Britain, so it wrote to the British chief constables stating, It is not the policy of His Majesty's government that any discrimination as regards the treatment of colored troops should be made by the British authorities. Any difference of treatment between white and colored troops may be regarded as racial discrimination, 
which will give rise to bitter resentment, they claimed, citing evidence from members of parliament as well as the general press. The British War Cabinet agreed that, about the majority of Jim Crow segregation, any directive given to the British people in this nation to emulate the American Army's treatment of colored people, American or otherwise, is likely to cause serious resentment among British subjects of color, as well as confusion, even protest, and resentment in the minds of the general public, who have been repeatedly asked to accept British colored colonial persons on equal terms and to extend to their hospitality and amiability. The British and American perspectives on people of color are very dissimilar. It is an evident fact that there are historical and social grounds for this, but we cannot force individuals to abandon their British traditions to embrace the American perspective on the color issue. African Americans not only faced racism within the U.S. military and throughout the U.S. government, but they also had to combat the fascism of white American soldiers abroad. African Americans were divided into distinct groups by the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps because their military prowess was inferior to that of white soldiers according to belief. The Army routinely put white officers from the American South in charge of black infantrymen, adding to this humiliation. In every theater of the war, African Americans distinguished themselves in combat despite these disheartening challenges. Among the most well-known black groups were the 761st Tank Battalion, which was a part of General George S. Patton's Third Army, and the 332nd Fighter Group, which knocked down 112 German aircraft during 179 bomber escort missions over Europe. African Americans served in equally vital positions throughout the Army as nurses, engineers, truck drivers, gunners, and paratroopers. Major General Willard S. Paul of the 26th Division singled out the 761st for special praise after its first action in France, writing, I consider the 761st Tank Battalion to have entered combat with such conspicuous courage and success as to warrant special commendation. The African-American 92nd and 93rd Infantry Divisions, which fought in the European and Pacific theaters respectively, are lesser known formations. In April and May of 1944, the 93rd Division's 25th Infantry Regiment participated in the Bougainville Battle. Amazingly, African-American troops were willing to give their lives to defend a nation that viewed them as second-class citizens. Different stories describe how German POWs were able to access facilities intended for white Americans, which black personnel were not permitted to use. Black men and women from throughout the nation rushed to enlist when the U.S. Marine Corps started accepting applications for a detachment of black Marines in June 1942. At Montford Point in North Carolina, these Marines received their training. Despite their superior gunnery and drill skills, the Montford Point Marines experienced the same prejudice and discrimination as men and women in the other branches. Major General Thomas Holcomb, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, was not happy about having to let African Americans into the Corps. Unlike the Army, the Marine Corps did not allow black men to become officers until November 1945. When Private R.J. Wood returned home on leave to Cleveland, Ohio, in May 1943, he was even jailed for posing as a Marine. The existence of African-American Marines was unknown to the police officers. Edgar Cole was advised not to wait on the corner for a Marine driver to pick him up and take him to Montford Point by a policeman in North Carolina, who smacked the official orders out of Cole's hand. Black Marines performed admirably in the battles of Peleliu, Saipan, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa despite the bigotry they faced. Over 18,000 Marines were trained at Montford Point by 1944, and another 12,000 were deployed abroad. African Americans managed to set themselves apart even in situations where they were not allowed to serve in combat roles. On December 7, 1941, Doris Dory Miller was working as a steward on board the USS West Virginia when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. During the attack, he operated a machine gun and transported injured sailors to safety despite never having received any training on the ship's armaments. Miller became the first African American to be awarded the Navy Cross for his actions. Dory's activities and the advocacy of civil rights organizations led to an increase in the number of black sailors serving in combat missions at sea for the U.S. Navy. The first ship with a predominantly black crew was the destroyer escort USS Mason, which was put into service by the Navy on March 20, 1944. 
In other campaigns throughout the Pacific, other African Americans working in construction battalions behind the lines volunteered for highly dangerous duty as stretcher carriers. Back home in America, African American men and women labored in military industries that produced the aircraft carriers and naval vessels of the world's most formidable Air Force and Navy. Civil rights advocates utilized the wartime accomplishments of African Americans as crucial proof to support their demands for equality. Even after U.S. military desegregation was mandated by President Harry S. Truman in 1948, African Americans' struggle for equal civil rights was far from over. Apart from the dangers of combat that all troops in the Civil War encountered, black soldiers also had to deal with extra issues arising from racial discrimination. Even in the North, there was a great deal of racial prejudice, and the U.S. military was not exempt from these practices. Black enlisted men made up the segregated units, which were usually led by black non-commissioned officers and white commanders. Robert Shaw led the 54th Massachusetts, and Thomas Wentworth Higginson led the 1st South Carolina. Both men were white. Initially, black troops received $10 a month, of which $3 was automatically withheld for clothes. This left them with $7 in net pay. White soldiers, on the other hand, were paid $13 a month, of which they received no clothing allowance. In June 1864, Congress granted equal pay to the U.S. colored troops and made the action retroactive. Black soldiers received the same rations and supplies. In addition, they received comparable medical care. When the Confederate Army took them, the black soldiers, however, were in greater danger than the white men. The Confederate Congress threatened to enslave black soldiers and punish black troop officers harshly in 1863. General Order 252, which threatened to avenge any maltreatment of black troops by Confederate prisoners of war, POWs, was consequently issued by President Lincoln. Black captives were usually treated worse than white hostages, even though the threat usually restrained the Confederates. Black Union troops captured during the 1864 engagement at Fort Pillow, Tennessee, were shot to death by Confederate soldiers in what is arguably the most horrific case of maltreatment known to exist. Despite being present at the killing, Confederate General Nathan B. Forrest took no action to halt it. Two main questions often center on the history of the African-American military experience during World War II. How did racism in the United States and the war affect the experiences of black Americans serving in the military? How did African-American soldiers alter the course of their wartime encounters? To determine the presence of black soldiers in upcoming conflicts, Military planners assessed the performance of black soldiers during World War I between the mid-1920s and the 1930s Great Depression. But frequently, their conversations regarding African-American service members in the armed forces were firmly rooted in racist innuendo, racist stereotypes, and American racist traditions, habits, and practices. Concurrently, leaders of the African-American community and those who supported them fought assiduously to ensure that the men and women in uniform who would eventually serve in the country's military would always be there. By using their right to vote, threatening to stage protests, suing, and lobbying the White House from 1939 to 1942, civil rights activists and their allies were able to win some small concessions from the military establishment. For the remainder of the war, however, the military persisted in its obstinate adherence to a policy prohibiting black and white soldiers from serving in the same battalions. Throughout the nation throughout their military training, black GIs experienced violence from military police, animosity from white officers, and hostility from civilians between 1943 and 1945. During the same period, systemic racism and sexism were experienced by African American servicewomen in the military. Black civil rights organizations, the media, and their allies launched the first rounds of the fight to safeguard and defend the welfare of black soldiers in uniform at different points in the American war effort. Fighting African-American GIs during World War II transformed them into foot warriors in the broader campaigns against foreign despotism. Black World War II, activists like Daisy Lampkin and Ruby Hurley, together with former service members, established the foundation for the civil rights movement after returning home in 1945. Black troops faced violent white mobs upon their return to the United States following the official end of World War II on September 2, 1945.
1945. These mobs were made up of people who hated African Americans in uniform and saw them as a danger to the Jim Crow social order. Apart from facing racial violence, black troops frequently did not receive benefits that were promised by the GI Bill, the comprehensive law that gave veterans access to business and housing financing, job placement aid, and tuition support. President Harry Truman signed Executive Order 9981, desegregating the United States, as civil rights campaigners continued to highlight America's hypocrisy as a democratic country with a Jim Crow army and Southern politicians steadfastly opposed complete racial equality for blacks. However, full integration would not happen until after the Korean War. It is so apparent that we must reconsider the Second World War's legacy of the black struggle for justice and equality and contest, the prevailing view that it was a time of inevitable advancement. Instead, one must evaluate gender, class, and geographical variations, as well as go beyond black leadership to the real-world experiences of average African-American men and women. During the war, hundreds of thousands of black Americans left the South to settle in the North or the West, an experience that often led to increased militancy. Meanwhile, for those who remained in the South, life continued to be marked by political helplessness, endemic violence, and racial discrimination. A more thorough examination of the war's timeline reveals that, Following a phase of cautious optimism, African Americans quickly began to feel an increasing feeling of pessimism as hate crimes and racial riots served as a reminder that the fight was far from ending. As so, the legacy of the conflict is incredibly unclear. Many African American veterans were so disappointed with America that it drove them to want to see change. They battled against prejudice and segregation with the same determination that had during the war. It is no accident that a large number of the key players in the 1950s and 1960s civil rights movement were also veterans. During the war, several of these servicemen were recommended for the Medal of Honor. However, the recommendations were either lost or rejected because African Americans are not traditionally awarded the highest military decoration in the country. Thousands of black soldiers saw action in World War II, and many of them distinguished themselves but no African-American personnel were awarded the Medal of Honor. If you liked this video and would like to see more about the history of black Americans and their impact on Western culture, don't forget to give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and share our content to spread awareness about the truth about black people and their stories. Thank you for your time and see you in the next video.